This Walsh walkthrough is titled Understanding and Searching for Evidence-Based Practice. This research module is presented in four parts as an overview discussing EBP, forming and using a PICO style research question, an introduction and brief overview of research through Walsh's library and database resources, and finishing up with pointers for APA style writing and reporting. I want you to have a better awareness of evidence-based practice, especially how it is formed and what solid, reportable research should look like. I also want you to consider and follow the principles of academic research discussed here, and would like you to remember that your Walsh Library offers support in many different ways, including access to your health and physical sciences librarian, the subject guides that collect various relevant digital resources, and contact information for your librarian. The library even supports your need for organizing and developing your research paper through different tutorials on APA style writing, guides for research, and citations and links to helpful resources like EndNote and the Walsh Library's YouTube page. Let's get started. This video module goes over what is evidence-based practice. In this overview, you will review the evidence pyramid, the building blocks of EBP, and be introduced to the five steps in evidence-based practice inquiry and research. Part of that research is in developing the elements of what you are searching for, which takes the shape of a PICO or PICOT style research question. More on PICO questions can be viewed in the next video of this series. Researchers build on evidence and practice by evaluating what has been discovered all across any field of study. The quality of this discovered knowledge varies and may not be applicable in all situations. Sometimes you'll hear phrases like expert opinion or other non-evidence-based guidelines. This layer of the foundation of evidence is all the other stuff and things you as a practitioner will pick up or do because it is necessary, practical, or effective enough for the situation at hand. While this layer is important in ways I don't have the time to discuss right now, you'll hopefully understand shortly why while this is a fundamental basis of knowledge, we aren't looking for this level of practice in academic writing. For our purposes of discovering what is evidence-based practice research writing, I want you to look over the pyramid on screen with me for a minute. At the bottom, the foundation of our pyramid is called background information. Individual case reports are lumped into this foundational layer though they may be a bit more informative to our research because of the documentation present in a case report. We are starting to get some verifiable data in our evidence here, but more is coming that will be more effective in laying a foundation for actual research writing coming up. As part of your everyday approach to practice, you may find yourself writing a lot of individual case reports in the form of patient notes and creating patient records for your treatment and services. Case studies, cohort studies, case reports, are observational methods for generating evidence, leading to data that will inform practitioners higher up the evidence chain. Think of this layer as laying the groundwork for the questions you'd like answered when looking higher up the evidence-based practice pyramid. A smaller sample size or a very limited question being asked is what keeps this type of information at a lower level than what comes next. Next up are randomized control trials or non-randomized control trials, moving us into data collection and information analysis that can take the shape of academic research writing. Their design makes information coming from these trials verifiable, meaning we can determine a legitimate and tested outcome from these results if the trial was managed properly. Randomized control trials are testing an intervention or treatment in a controlled way to lessen any quote-unquote fuzzy data that may be present when working with individuals or small groups of similar patients. What is this all leading to? Why are we concerned about the format and process of research? The more definitive and secured from outside interference, the research requires a methodology and a freeing from research bias. Randomization prevents the skewing or deliberate manipulation of results. Bias in selection for any benefit to the researcher or patient is eliminated through a random process. Scientists refer to the skewing of information as selection bias. An RTC gets rid of selection bias by removing the element of choice. 
There could be a lot of reasons for bias in research, but everyone ultimately wants the results of research to be beneficial for application to the field and not just for monetary gain or fame or recognition or positive press. This is why researchers try to eliminate as many questions about the research that are not directly related to it by the testing methodology. The top tier of research is the critical appraisal, which is just another way of saying, let's look at all of the results from below critically. Critically appraised topics or papers, uh, systematic reviews, meta-analysis are different ways of sorting and weighing evidence about something to answer some question. Evidence-based practice is a process through this evidence pyramid, but at the topmost point is, to use a bad analogy, the Supreme Court of evidence and practice. The top tier of the pyramid is justifying the work that came before, judging it on its merits and construction, utilizing the best, most valid studies to make the case for some action related to some topic. Going through the process to construct this level of research reporting takes time, and it really helps to have some method for doing it. We're going to discuss this method next. The five steps of evidence-based practice through another example. I'm going to try and talk you through an example of the process of assessing evidence-based practice. This is the part that actually got me interested in graduate studies the most. Once you can put this process into context, I hope it will be an easier model to understand and appreciate in the future. Say I have a question about a five-year-old with delays in their uh, hand grip for writing. What would be some of the questions I'd ask to inform me about my next steps in treatment? Can he or she hold a pencil? How well? What about a thick marker? How does a patient do with that? Okay, so how well is well? Is there a scale? If I can determine a scale or measure to track my patient on, how do I improve towards a goal? What is an appropriate goal? If I've found a scale, there's probably some benchmarks to it that should inform me as to where to place my client on that scale. How to evaluate their process. I'll need to use my knowledge of writing technique and sensory input along with other considerations to help them proceed. Over time, with certain interventions and therapeutic application of knowledge, I should be able to assess their progress and determine my next steps. Will we ever reach a particular benchmark? If development still isn't more normal, do I continue using the methods I already have been? Should I do something else? What else? All that questioning has taken you through the five steps of evidence-based practice. When you ask questions, you'll need to find the answers. You can go at the problem on your own, relying on your own knowledge to deal with the deficits. Uh, that would be the lowest level of evidence-based practice that we discussed earlier. Or you could work uh, with the client while evaluating their skill and make some determinations from your own experience, along with experience gained from other clients who've had similar deficits and approach this client in a similar fashion. That would be the second tier of the pyramid we discussed. Eventually, you may find yourself without knowledge of how to proceed. Maybe it's your first time with a five-year-old with writing deficit. Uh, so you look to answer some questions about how to treat. You begin trying to find out about five-year-olds and writing skills and deficits, but you find quickly that those terms don't really return enough for you to make headway. Or maybe there's enough in those resources to help you. That would be the third tier of our pyramid. But somewhere out there, there are researchers, academic students, professors, or research groups who have sorted through all the other stuff, uh, Medline, PubMed, stuff on the web, and have tested those findings uh, in their own resources and picked out what seemed to be the most effective most often with most clients given the situation your client is facing and have validated this through critical appraisal about what they're reporting on. That would be the fourth uh, layer of the critical appraisal of evidence-based practice we went through earlier. So how do we get into doing the higher academic stuff? Well, to start off, we need to formulate a question that can be answered. Go back over to that foundational pyramid and remember a big portion of supporting evidence is at the bottom. The circumstantial, the individual, and the unique make up much of our lives as professionals and practitioners. 
This should be celebrated as we're called to be servants to others. And being informed takes more than just researching the higher branches of evidence. However, this exercise is to help you gather new knowledge for yourself so that you may apply it when the time or situation comes. We want all our students to graduate as knowledgeable students and practitioners so that you can go out and do good work when, where, and for whom it is needed. This application of knowledge is wisdom, and a wise person knows that we take actions based on sound, solid information. That's why it is important now to learn how to ask good questions later and to seek solid data and information to be able to discern it from less valid information resources. You must create knowledge for yourself out of the best information out there. The five steps are to ask a question, search for answers, critically appraise those sources of answers, and implement or do the work. Lastly, evaluate your outcomes. You see that the step five leads right back to one, meaning there's always more questions to be asked and answers to be sought out. On screen in these steps is another way to look at the research process when you are an active doer of the research versus when you are just evaluating the research. All right, on to actually asking that research question. PICO, or PICOT, what is it? P stands for patient, where you will look to describe the client base you are most interested in answering the research question about. What are their salient characteristics? What defines this population or patient? I is for intervention. What do you want to do or how do you want to engage this patient. This is the therapy, exercise, or treatment you want to learn about. C is for comparison, which in a perfect world you'd have a comparison of what your intervention was being tested against to determine value, but it isn't as common in the literature as you'd hope. Often you'll see many different variations of an intervention with the same patient or population value, and you'll have to do some comparisons on your own. O is outcome. What are you hoping to achieve, measure, or change for the patient? An outcome could be to not have something be happening, or to have some measurable increase, or to become something more positive for your client or patient. You'll probably construct a solid outcome to shoot for after looking at the evidence, or you may already have an outcome in mind and you're looking for interventions that will help you get to it. T then is time. Time is a way to scope the literature or limit the resources you are looking at. If time is a factor in your treatment, you'll want to be aware of it and not mix different time intervals into your literature review. In our next video, we will go over the formation of a PICO or PICOT question. Once you've determined, or at least set on a basic PICO formula, you'll begin your research through our academic research databases and catalogs. The research process for a critically appraised paper or topic or a systematic review takes shape from this point on, so hopefully the next parts in this process will be more engaging and exciting for you as a researcher.